are and caring for your leaders in this time of ever-changing realities, you are welcome here. Whoever you are, wherever you come from, whomever you love, wherever you are in life's journey, we welcome you. Today is an extra awesome day. We are First Universalist, First Unitarian, and the Unitarian Universalist Church of Canada, Woo! <laughs> three vibrant, loving churches. And while we are indeed three separate churches, we are all Unitarian Universalists. And outside of this time of interesting things, when would we all be together like this? That's awesome. Thank you. Our shared faith teaches us to heed science, to care for the vulnerable, to celebrate life, to come together in partnership, sharing what we have. And so in this moment, when we can't meet safely indoors, the folks from Clinton Avenue and Canadigua have joined the folks of, of Winton Road to gather online and outdoors in person. We acknowledge with respect the Seneca Nation, keepers of the Western Door, and part of the Haudenosaunee people whose ancestral lands all three churches now stand. 
If you are here for the first time this morning, we are so glad you are here on this awesome day. And we hope that you'll connect with one or all three of our congregations, joining us while we are meeting together here and finding a home within Unitarian Universalism. Online, you'll see links in the chat to visitors' forms. And here in person, we invite you to stop by one of the welcome tables. Um, usually there's one by the back, but people will welcome you wherever you go. Ask. Uh, and let us know how we can connect with you so we can offer you a welcome beyond today. I am Reverend Michelle Yates. I am the Minister of Lifespan Faith Development at First Universalist. Preaching today is Reverend Sherry Holiday Kwan of First Unitarian. Uh, leading worship with us today are uh, Reverend A.J. Van Tyne from First Unitarian, Reverend Eileen Casey Campbell from the UU Church of Canandaigua. Woo! Our music directors, Brock Cheswald and Lynn Kinsman. We've got Emily, Eric, and Brendan working on sound online. And online and in person, we have ushers, we have greeters, we have chaplains, we have hosts making all of this possible. Thank you. And of course, it is not a church without people, without you. So thank you. It is so good to be together this morning. I invite forward Eileen, Reverend Eileen Casey Campbell to light our chalice, or to lead us in our chalice lighting. Well, while Michelle lights our chalice, I invite you to join in our chalice lighting words, which are printed on the front of your order of service. We gather this hour as people of faith, with joys and sorrows, gifts and needs. We light this beacon of hope, the sign of our quest for truth and meaning in celebration of the life we share together. I invite you to sing along with us for the doxology, a statement of belief, which is on your screen or um, on your order of service. So I don't know if some First Unitarian folks might remember me. Eleven years ago, when I was a seminary student here at Colgate Rochester Crozier Divinity School, I did a year of field education study here at First Unitarian. And part of one of the things I was learning about was religious education. How perfect that that's the kind of ministry I end up doing now. Uh, and I was working with Sheila, your director of religious education here, and I did times both as a workshop leader for the K through fives and as a traveler. And so that means that you go around with the same group of kids for like five weeks. And, and I was still young. This was before I was married and had step kids and a kid of my own. And I wasn't really great with kids. This was a challenge for me. And... I had a kid in one of my groups who you might think of as a bad apple. It was a challenge for him to sit still. It was a challenge for him to listen to directions. It was a challenge for him to, to engage with whatever the activity was in the way that everyone else was doing it. It was a challenge for him not to, to touch his peers. And it was a challenge for me to deal with this and to not label him a bad apple or a bad kid. I'm like, inherit worth and dignity, inherit worth and dignity. 
Thankfully, I had a cousin who was a teacher at the time who said, when, first of all, introducing me to the idea of kids being neurodivergent and that if they're not trying to give you a hard time, they're having a hard time, which blew my mind and prepared me for my kids down the line. And that if a kid especially is acting out in class, it's because they are in need of attention or affection from either the adults or the other kids. So it's like, okay, I am going to give this kid all the attention and affection. I need. He's going to be my favorite kid. Inherit with the dignity. Inherit with the dignity. But I was shocked. It didn't happen right away. And this wasn't like a miracle. We, we don't want to change neurodivergent people. We want to find ways of welcoming and integrating them into the, the programs in the community that we have. And when I welcomed him with joy and enthusiasm, he was glad, more glad to be there. And when I showed genuine caring and appreciation for him, he could better listen to the boundaries we had in place to keep everyone feeling safe and included. And when I appreciated and listened and asked about what he was doing in his art with interest, he told me. He told me about how he wanted to do a little different than everyone else and about the art he was doing and this crazy, like, s amazing symbolism, religious symbolism that he was putting into, into his art projects. Uh, it was so deep and that I never would have known if I hadn't cared and asked. And then I saw a look that I now know as a parent when he ran out of the class ahead of time and I was like, wait, you forgot your mask, all this awesome work you put into it. And he was so proud that I saw it. And he could be proud to his mom. And that look from mom of, thank you. Thank you for seeing my kid, the inherent worth and dignity of this beautiful, vibrant being who is different and unique in his own way. And what a way to savor the harvest, to see that that love and care created a relationship. And isn't that why we come to church? For to be received with joy and to be glad to be there, to be cared about enough, to be welcomed into right relationship and healthy community together. And to someone to care enough about you and your journey, to listen to your projects that you'll share and develop a relationship that is life-affirming and often life-saving. Thank you for being here. Thank you for creating that community, for receiving each other with joy, with gladness, with enthusiasm, with a listening and open heart, because you never know who needs that this morning. All right, please join us in singing our first hymn. Please stand if you're willing and able. It'll warm you up. The words are on your screen or in your order of service for, for all this that is our life. There are four verses. Please sing along. <clears throat> for all that is our life, we sing our thanks and praise. For all life is a gift which we are called to use to build the common good and make our own days glad. For needs which others serve, for services we give, for work and its rewards, for hours of rest and love, we come with praise and thanks for all that is our life. For sorrow we must bear, for failures, pain, and loss, for each new thing we learn, for fearful hours that pass, we come with praise and thanks for all that is our life. For all that is our life, we sing our thanks and praise. For all life is a gift 
which we are called to use to build the common good and make our own days glad. We are I see we've got a pattern underneath the sweaters and the <laughs> but I've remembered to turn on my mic now and we are called to build the common good called to use our gifts and to make our own days glad each week when we gather members and friends of our congregations join in the collective practice of generosity Join because together we are able to do things that none of us can do alone. And while our churches have been gathering this fall under a big tent, it has been our practice that on the third Sunday of each month, our collective gathering gives generously to another organization helping us live out our mission here in Rochester and New York State. Got a little cleaner sound now? Maybe. We'll be okay. This month, we share our offering. Our entire collection today goes to New York Unitarian Universalist Justice. This organization is the inheritor of interfaith impact, and it combines the impact of Unitarian Universalists across New York State to make legislative impact. We work primarily on criminal justice, climate change, and housing. But there are a variety of ways in which Unitarian Universalists have identified that in New York State, through state advocacy and legislation, Unitarian Universalists can have a moral voice in our state politics, can help make change in the lives of everyday people. And so we ask you to give generously whether you're here under the tent or online, you can give online to any of our three churches. Or if you're here in person, we ask you to come forward and place money into the collection box. Our offering will now be generously given and humbly received.
like to invite you now into a time of centering and shared silence, followed by a meditation. So I invite you to get comfortable where you sit here in the tent or in your home, to take a deep breath in and let it out with a sigh. To take a deep breath in to prepare yourself for silence, knowing, of course, by silence we mean the absence of grown-ups talking so that we can listen more closely to the sounds of life. The cars driving by on the road behind, your neighbor's breath beside you, our children playing and learning down the hill, the birds singing in the trees. Let us share in silence now. Let us take one more deep breath in together and let it out with a sigh. Between the pangs of childbirth, I thought of Tiamat, that ancient sea goddess split in half to create the world. Creation tore me apart and, oh, yep, screamed my every muscle, I get it now. I had forgotten in that moment the postscript those clever Semites added, and God said it was good. A world born out of swirling waters of chaos, and God said it was good. A world with fat baby thighs and sun-dappled forests, and chamomile tea with rye toast, and skinny dipping at sunrise just because you're 19, so utterly good divinity weighs in to proclaim it so. A world with tyrants and genocides, disease and hurricanes, waste and white supremacy and socks that slip down inside your boot and pain so bad you think surely it will split you apart. And still, we promise ourselves to whichever God can love even this shit, because with a love like that, pulsing in the waters of the deep, we can be pulled utterly apart and still somehow weep at the goodness of it all. Amen. We honor the many joys and sorrows present here among us this morning and each week. Whatever you are carrying with you this morning, whatever is on your heart and mind, whoever is on your heart and mind, and however your spirit arrives this morning, we have a ritual time now set aside to honor that we each come here to worship with both celebrations and sorrow, both joys and great pain. If you're online during this time, I invite you to mindfully type out your joy or sorrow or combination into the chat and spend a moment rereading it before you hit send to release them into the loving embrace of the community, to really feel their weight and impact before you release it into the community. In we ask that you come up and place stones from our own Lake Ontario, smooth by the waters and the waves there, and you place the stone into our shared waters of community this morning. Again, you are invited to lift the stone and meditate upon your joy or sorrow to feel that weight and impact before releasing it into the healing waters of this community to be held and supported. 
And this morning, First Unitarian is holding a sorrow that Eric Bellman passed away yesterday, surrounded by family and friends. Please remain seated while we sing together, voice still and small, two times through. Voice still and small, deep inside all, I hear you call, singing. In storm and rain, sorrow and pain, still will remain. Singing, calming my fears, quen 
quenching my tears through all the years singing voice still and small deep inside all I hear you call singing in storm and rain sorrow Our transitions take a little longer than they used to. It's just with the mics on and the masks off, that all is just less smooth than it used to be. And that's okay. That's what it's like these days. Can't forget that things are not quite what they used to be, a little stranger, but it's not the first time we, as humankind, have done this sort of thing. In the great plague of London in 1665, the last time England had to wrestle in a significant way with an outbreak of the bubonic plague, people were very much doing what we're doing now, going outside as often as they could, spreading out spending less time indoors and bundled up. I'd recommend we bundle up outside. As our kids keep reminding me, you can just put on more clothes, and this is all fine. And it's fine most of the time, but we all struggle under the burden of change and disappointment. But during pandemic, this particular pandemic, I have been often amused and delighted by the curious ways people drum up trouble and pain for each other. Early in Zoom church, our friends down at Universalist told me that they had been Zoom bombed during a Wednesday morning meditation somebody had come in and made a mess of their time together. I was outwardly empathetic, compassionate. I didn't want that to happen to anyone who I knew and loved. But inside, I thought it was kind of funny. <laughs> Until it happened to us two weeks later. And whatever amusement I held about Zoom bombing was crushed under the reality that it feels like an incredible betrayal and violation in a time of tenderness to have someone interject themselves and do things that really baffle the mind, seem to have no purpose, and yet made my life worse, felt unfair, unjust, I was not amused anymore. But my lack of amusement doesn't stop other people from doing mischievous, mean things. And indeed, one of the most lasting legacies of the bubonic plague was, I guess lasting means lots of different things, but marketing and a good merchandising plan is one such legacy is the strategies that burglars used during that time of death and disease. There's an ointment, a concoction, a scent called Four Thieves, and you can walk into a home goods store now and buy a candle. But 400 years ago, the Four Thieves concoction was a mixture of herbs that thieves who would burglarize homes of those with plague 
used to keep themselves safe and well. A bunch of herbs stuffed up into your mask was also what plague doctors used, also what everyday ordinary people would try to use to keep themselves safe. But the four thieves were the best at it, were known for their particular blend that became a public health good. This smell, as we now know, actually did nothing to help these thieves because plague was spread by fleas and not smells. But still, this idea that both public health and doing things that are harmful to others became embedded in each other during a time of great confusion, well, that's a time-honored tradition. Over the last two months, some of you may know, and for some of you this may be news, but over the last two months, a trend on the social media platform TikTok has become widespread. Not nearly as widespread as the panic by other generations would lead you to believe, but the high schoolers among us know that it is both real and not quite as bad as everyone says. This trend called devious licks began by encouraging people to steal masks and hand sanitizer and toilet paper from their school bathrooms. Out of school for over a year and suddenly returning to a place where the rhythms and rules of life were not something that you got to dictate People made their own fun and wrested some sense of control and agency and adventure. Devious licks has spread to asking people to smack a teacher, which is uh, not quite as mischievous and instead just awful. But so too was the removal of entire bathroom fixtures, toilets and sinks. But as it turned out, many of those, though some were real, many were spoofs, many just videos that weren't actually happening, but made just to get laughs and attention. And before we start thinking Gen X, or sorry, Gen Z, are a terrible generation and kids these days are awful. It's good to remember that every generation has its problems. My generation, millennials, convinced everyone that skinny jeans look good and leggings are pants. <laughs> Nobody likes the attitude of Gen X and baby boomers and the silent generation are mostly to blame for climate change. And so we've all got our things. And it's worth noting that kids these days also have some pretty playful and creative vocabularies. Devious licks, when banned off this platform, move to vicious licks and dastardly licks. So anyone who thinks kids these days don't know how to use a thesaurus are wrong. Life and mischief will find a way. It is a time-honored tradition and not just for our youth, but also in the sacred texts and stories that bind us together. The Norse god of mischief, Loki, was known for theft, known for a relentless campaign to, in his case, create chaos so that humankind would come to know his benevolent, tyrannical rule. But this trickster god is deeply beloved and embedded in the stories that we have told as humans for all of time, all of our gathering. Loki finds his glorious purpose of wanting to achieve this world tyranny, this fascist regime that he, of course, would be able to rule with a gentle hand in his opinion, when his own life is disrupted. 
in some tellings of this story, he launches on this campaign as a reaction to finding out that he's been lied to for years by his family, that he's been adopted, and that nobody bothered to tell him. Now this story, it trades on what I think are harmful stereotypes about adoption, but the idea that one's glorious purpose can be born in a time of disorder and chaos and personal dislocation, a time when he felt unloved, did not know what his home was, that the rules and rhythms were no longer of his making, well, that becomes his central driving force. Now, Loki is a story that has been told for centuries, but many people know it now through Marvel movies, through blockbusters. But like everything else, it went from public space to homes and private locations when Loki went from the big screen to televisions and computer screens and iPads and phones, when it was made into a TV series that came out during pandemic. And Loki's story then moves into the next chapter. Our ancient sacred stories of gods and their dealings become the stuff of television shows. And our story continues. Loki's glorious purpose of a fascist regime benevolently ruled by him moves, shifts, changes. Like every good story, people don't come out the same as they went in. And Loki finds through dealings with largely himself dealings with other versions of himself and looking in the mirror again and again in this space that he finds himself in between the world as he knew it and the world as it hopes it will be, discovers a new glorious purpose. This thing that he is burdened with, this idea that he wakes up every morning to create something that is not yet here for him, moves from being a kingdom that he might rule to simply playing a part in a world as it unfolds, in which he sees himself in connection with other people. The Loki of television, though the series is not yet done, seems to be heading toward a fairly regular practice of sacrificial love. The Norse god of mischief is, as it turns out, a softy. And though devious licks, and I should probably explain that licks means theft, I apologize for leaving that out, but you all got it. Devious licks, though overblown in terms of its impact, on TikTok exists alongside another emerging trend called angelic yields. Kids these days seeing peers online and also sometimes also finding themselves caught up in the excitement and rush of doing something deviant turned that trend too into a trend of bringing in an extra box of masks just in case someone forgets one. Being nice to your teacher just because. And other bizarre and creative possibilities. I, yeah, they deserve a round of applause, kids <laughs> these days. It's not just kids, though, of course, who have found themselves disordered, finding themselves caught in the rhythms and rules not of their own making. All of us have, over the last 18 months, found ourselves some days waking up and thinking, what was it I was meant to do today with my life? Is this 
Is this it? Burdened with glorious purpose can be answered in all sorts of ways. While those four thieves, of which of course there were many more, were finding their ways into homes and stuffing their noses full of herbs during that great plague, alongside those options, you had to a 19-year-old named Isaac retreating to his country home after having to leave university and watching his apple tree out the window. You had that 19-year-old boy named Isaac putting a prism in the window to see how light might refract, might move through, and turn from all white into a great splendor of diverse colors. That young boy, Isaac, though not as if in a moment with an apple falling on his head, but over the course of a year of deep focus and study and many, many more years of everyday burden, became the father of modern physics. And though Newtonian physics is not a complete explanation or even an entirely accurate explanation of how the universe works, we've got a pretty good idea of how lots of knowledge is arranged, how physics works most of the time on a human scale from that same period of the Black Plague or the Great Death or the Bubonic Plague. The glorious purpose that drives us out of boredom and a sense of lack of control to mischief, to claiming agency wherever we might, also invites us into practices of everyday focus and normal, regular gratitude. To be able to shift from making fun at the expense of others to noticing rainbows and apples. It's a choice available. Now, I don't mean to suggest that a good attitude solves all problems. Depression, anxiety, and mental health are not things one can simply buck up and have a good attitude about. But to be able to each and every morning choose how we might make that day a little bit better for ourselves and for the people around us is the glorious purpose to which we are all called, the glorious purpose that we are all burdened with. Each and every one of us carries a burden, carries whatever gifts we are given, our abilities to sing, our abilities to move, our abilities to make something of that day does not happen in one instant, but in the slow and everyday practice that are our own angelic yields. Generation Z, with their devious licks, their dastardly spoofing, their social media trends, is a great reminder to me that the mischief that we create, the tricks that we play on one another, can have all sorts of impacts. They can have deep betrayals, small violations, ordinary senses of being disregarded or unloved, or having seen ourselves as the object of some purpose, they can call us to, to the everyday focus that is our lives. And so I invite you into a practice now. It is, I will admit, an obnoxious one that anyone who has ever shared a room with me at a conference or at a youth group trip 
or because you're married to me, <laughs> hate. <laughs> they find it terrible, every single one of them. It is my own devious, not theft, but trick. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit, just as I do every morning. And I want you to imagine that your curtains are closed, if you have curtains. Maybe you don't, maybe you have shades. I actually have shades specifically for this practice because it is more joyful with shades than it is with curtains, but both are good. And we're gonna physically do this because when we do things in our bodies, we remember them more. And you're gonna throw open the curtains and say, good morning, Rochester. <laughs> In Rochester each and every morning I wake up and I do this and everybody I share a room with hates it some mornings it's the afternoon because I didn't get a good night's sleep the night before or maybe I needed a little bit more rest but whenever it happens to be I throw open the curtains, or I snap up the shade, and I say, and say it with me again, good morning, Rochester. It is devious, it is dastardly, it is obnoxious, and each and every day, it is an, an angelic yield to my life, a reminder that I am burdened, as are all of you, with glorious purpose. So now that you're already up, please join me and Lynn and Brock. I'm gonna put my mask back on and we're gonna all sing really loudly. Even the people at home are closing him for the day. Yes, especially those people at home. Let's have you stand up too and stretch your body. And we'll sing three verses together. Just as long as I have breath, I must answer yes to life. Though with pain I made my way, still with hope I meet each day. If they ask what I did well, tell them I said yes to life. Just as long as vision lasts, I must answer yes to truth. In my dream and in my dark, always that elusive spark. If they ask what I did well, tell them I said yes to truth. Just as long as my heart beats, I must answer yes to love. Disappointment pierced me through, still I keep on loving you. If they ask what I did best, tell them I said yes to love. Please join me in our closing words used by First Universalist and now by all three of us, written by the Reverend Maddie Safantis. We extinguish this flame, but we keep its light in our hearts with its message of love and justice, taking it outside these walls to the world we live in until we are together again. Amen. Amen. Please join me as we go from this place by putting your hand on your heart and feeling its beat. 
It's a good thing to do in the morning after you have thrown open the curtains. Because as your heart beats, so too do those here gathered in this place. So too do those all around the world. May we go from this place knowing that we are burdened with glorious purpose. And that purpose may shift over the course of our lives. But it is ours to use our gifts to free ourselves from that heaviness of burden and live life to its fullest and most glorious. Go in peace. Amen.